Okay. Oh, mochi mochi. Oh, I, um, Dr. Know-it-all, I'm so sorry. I'm in the middle of a conference here. Um, I can't call you back? Okay, well look, I have a serious problem. I have many patients who are quite ill with unsustain unsustainability. Can you help us? I'm, it's really urgent and critical. How many patients? Well, there are about seven billion, at least the last time I counted. Uh, and, and there's more coming. So what can I do? Yeah, okay, yeah. All right, well, th so let me just be clear. I give them one sustainability, no, oh, 17 sustain UN sustainability goal pills every day for the next 11 years and call you in 2030, and that'll fix it. Ah, okay, well, um, thank you, I think. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> Well, I, I'm afraid that's a bit simplistic. Um, maybe he's been talking to Trump, I don't know. Um, but more seriously, I think there are other ways we're going to have to approach this, and that's what I'd like to talk about. But first of all, thank you for the opportunity to come here and to be with you and to hear the other talks and learn together about these issues. These are things which we all need to be thinking about together in different ways and from different aspects. We all have different ways of looking at this and I just want to talk about one approach that I'm trying to understand and develop. And what we can really put it together right away by sort of saying we're in the Anthropocene and we can't go back. And it isn't a matter of just turning around and changing things. We're in an age in which the human species has already for some time, and there's an argument about did this start with the Industrial Revolution or did it start with agriculture, doesn't matter. The point is that humanity is making enormous changes on a planetary scale, both good and bad, if you will, and we need to find out how can we address this together because it is not something we can simply do alone. It is not something that we can do with one area of expertise, one discipline, or one country, or one approach. So this is a plurality of efforts that we have to bring together. And we know about these various things. I'm not gonna spend time on them, the planetary boundaries, um, the, uh, Will Steffen's hockey sticks acceleration, uh, great acceleration, both the uh, social economic trends and the earth system trends, and Kate Rayworth's very interesting donut economics, or I would say annulus, between the planetary boundaries and the social boundaries. All of those are different ways then of coming to thinking about what has been agreed at a political level of the SDGs, as you well know. But I want to really ask about this in a slightly different way. The, we, have, we have the normative assertion, if you will, that we live in the Anthropocene age, that it's a gr in the midst of this great acceleration, the rapid changes, and so, how can we make the kinds of societal changes that we al will allow us to move to sustainable futures? And let me emphasize two things. I don't tend to use the word sustainable development because that's in some ways a difficult term in itself. What do we mean by that? And second, I use futures plural because the future in a sustainable sense is not the same in every condition. The people I was working with in northern Siberia or in Alaska have a very different set of issues in their future than the, the people that my graduate student working in the slums in Kibera outside Nairobi have to face. But we all have to figure out how overall, globally, coherently, we can move towards a sustainable future for all of humanity. So 
one of the ways that I try to think about this, how can we make these changes? And one of the ways is to think about social movements and with justice and equity, not just the change, not just the development, but where does just, justice and equity come into this? What factors enable or hinder this kind of social movement? My quick point is that this is a different kind of social movement than we've seen in the past. We know, and I was deeply involved with Martin Luther King's organization in civil rights, there we have movements towards women's rights, we have labor movements, we know about those. So, so sustainability is a tough one because it's not narrowly defined and it's not so clear how does it relate to me personally, whereas the others were more clear. So what insights into these factors can we find in narrative expressions of vision and identity and how do social dynamics relate to the indicators of sustainability at multiple scales, some of which we talked about earlier this morning in the uh, lectures. And how, lastly, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about boundary objects. I'll tell you more what I mean by this. Uh, for example, games, to help people recognize and cope with the inherent consequences of being part of a complex system. So let me talk a little bit about systems, sustainability, and society. Very important, crucial point, which I don't think is new here, but for some people is a new idea. Society is fundamentally embedded in the natural systems on which it is entirely dependent. And by that, when I talk about natural systems or ecosystems, some people will say, oh, yes, there's a very nice forest over there, three kilometers. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where do the clothes you're wearing come from? What air are you breathing? What water are you drinking? Those are all part of the ecosystem on which we are dependent. Second, that societies define their relationship, what is valuable in the en environment. It's not something that's given to us. We each and every environment, every culture, every context define that aspect in terms of their, our own societies. And sustainability therefore depends on how we define it. And what's important is the sense of agency and responsibility to act. By agency, I mean whether you feel you are capable of acting. That is not just can you act, I mean, should you just do something, but are you, do you feel you are able to and are you able to actually perform what is needed to make change? And do you feel that you have a responsibility to do that? And those are critical here. And societies must, therefore, because of this rapid acceleration and change, we can't go by old rules. There is no textbook that says, here's what you do today, and if there's a new problem tomorrow, you go look in a different chapter of the textbook. Sorry, doesn't work. We need something else, so we need to be learning. We need a, a fundamental process of societal learning, co-design that is designed collaboratively, and innovation for societal well-being, not just innovation for cool products and good marketing. That's not sufficient. And that's a question of well-being and indeed even of survival of societies in this particular circumstance. So in a way, the key challenge that I'm interested in addressing is the, is the way of changing collective human behavior rather than focusing on trying to fix what's already broken. We need to do that also, but we need to really figure out how we make these changes, fundamental changes. So it's about learning, innovating, negotiating, and navigating in a process of moving towards sustainable futures. 
In that, it's worth pointing out something about complexity, which again may be entirely familiar to everyone, but I want to put it there in front of us. There is a fundamental and inherent in uncertainty, not because we're stupid or we can't do good science or we haven't done the science, but because a complex system has undefined causalities by necessity. I mean, that's the nature of the beast. I won't go into that now, but that we could discuss later. Second, there is normative ambiguity. That is, it matters, values matter. And people have different values, different cultures, different environments, different ethical standards, different norms. So there's a fundamental ambiguity in the way we define the goals and how we interpret what we see around us. That's an important point, is the interpretation. The data doesn't just get up and talk to us. We interpret data. It's like if you have a, a piece of, a sheet of music, and it's got uh, five lines across it and a bunch of dots and lines on the, that, on those uh, dots and things on that line, and you take, pick up your violin and you play every note, you can play every note, but that's not interpreting. What makes music is the interpretation of that data, and that is no different than what science does. And third, there are unintended consequences, and that's because of the feedback loops in a complex system are dispersed in time and space. So something I do here in Kyoto today maybe affects people in Kyoto today, but maybe it affects people in Bangladesh tomorrow or 10 years from now or in the United States in 100 years or whatever. So we don't always know what the actual consequences are. And that affects where, where, how we get into problems of unintended consequences and unanticipated consequences. And we can think of lots of those. So given that, we need the perspectives and the methods of disciplines. You need the depth, and the, it's absolutely necessary, it's essential. We have the depth and breadth of knowledge from all the fields. Yeah, yeah, microphone has something. Oh. So please change the microphone. Yeah, it seems, to, no, it's, it's going out. Thanks, <laughs> I thought it, was, it sounded a little different. Um, okay, uh, so the point is that we need the, the, the expertise and the narrow areas of focus of all the fields of disciplines that we know are absolutely essential, necessary, but they are not sufficient. They are not sufficient in and of themselves to solve the complex issues that we face. So we need a synthetic, a holistic, if you will, approach to science and to addressing these problems in the broadest sense, from global to local. And I would say that as part of that, we need to engage openly and respectfully with both the knowledge and the creativity of people all over the world. Oh my God, three minutes, never make it. Um, narratives are a lens with which to see this. This is um, ridiculous, but okay, we'll try. Um, so I want to talk, one of the things is talking about narratives. And narratives are usually thought about as long stories, and humans have done this throughout their existence. But also that it's a question that they reflect both our vision of the future, but they also reflect identities. And identities are important because they have a lot to do with our motivation to act or oppose change. And I'll give you a couple of quick examples. An indigenous artist's memorial to vi villages painted on the corner of his house and on the, the wall in front of it after landslides buried his community in Taiwan. Or Martin Luther King's famous talk and what's interesting about this is it was a very long speech, very powerful, very beautiful, very moving, but what remains is this condensed little affective narrative, this emotional expression, I have a dream, and he repeated it. 
And it is that that stays and powers people's reactions in many ways. Or a friend of mine, a wonderful uh, colleague and friend, Cassie Mater, um, developed this uh, choreography. It can be dance in that form. Or in a very negative sense, the campaign against Agenda 21, two states in the United States voted against sustainability in 2012. Believe it or not, they voted against sustainability, made it outlawed, um, because not because of the science, not because of sustainability, but because of the idea of American individualism and, uh, and um, the sense that this was an a, a incursion on American freedom. And then, of course, we have this character. And I'm sorry for the misspelling, but by great, I think it means that rubs people the wrong way. Um, so there are narratives that have power, and we need to attend to that. We have had a symposium in Taipei in September, in early October, looking at narratives from uh, examples all over the world. And we will go on with that to categorize the narratives and use it to develop social modeling. Um, I know the time's up, but give me a couple more minutes to finish. Um, the, the idea is getting to uh, na narrative from sorry to social dynamics from narratives. I'm going to skip this quickly because it just will take too much time. There's one other thing is that the point is the modeling that we're trying to do, and I can talk about this more later, um, is about looking at plausible pathways to change, not about predicting. These are not predictive. They are meant as ways of increasing the creativity of our thinking. And that's a very important distinction here. And um, the very briefly, we have a panel on Global Sustainability Strategy Forum that Ordwin Wren, Sandra Vanderleo, and myself are leading a new program. But looking at judgment of these sustainability target of, of the processes, not just the solutions, and that's informed by, but not limited to, all the SDG indices and everything else that Michelle and, and uh, Gerald mentioned. Um, and the real point is to try to make the thinking transparent. How are we thinking about those goals and how are experts from all over the world, uh, they're quite well distributed, approach this? So what's the focus of pro on process that leads to solutions at multiple scales? How do we frame language that makes it better in terms of linking with policy challenges and linking processes with policy options? I think because of time, I'm going to just end with this uh, last slide um, that basically trying to look for motivation for change and process. And in that, asking the question, why do we assume that stability is the normative expectation? We should really be thinking about how to change to strengthen adaptive capacity and agency and to design forward with creativity and by learning from the past, not copying the past, and seek opportunities for constructive change and design but also to build more effective ways to engage more people in the design process in the broadest sense and in understanding how their role in the complex <coughs> system. I don't have time to show you the examples of games and so forth, but happy to talk about that maybe later. Thank you. <laughs>